Is living in the clouds of Venus better than living in subsurface habitats on Mars? Can we really lock ourselves from orbit with space junk? Should we build another version of Biosphere before going to Mars? And Q&A Plus, is abiogenesis really unlikely? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Mr. Kyle, how do we distinguish the motion of galaxies due to the expansion of the universe from the actual motion of galaxies as they move through space? So at the closest scale, galaxies are moving entirely through space that there, you know, there isn't a lot of the expansion of the universe that is sort of defining the motion of galaxies. Like for example, Andromeda is moving towards us and it's two and a half million light years away. Triangulum galaxy is moving towards us. There's about 60 dwarf galaxies that are locked up with us in Andromeda and uh, Triangulum and they will eventually turn into this giant elliptical galaxy. But once you go a little bit farther than that, like maybe about say six million light years away out to 10 million light years away, then it's the expansion of the universe it, that's the thing that is taking over. And then as you go farther and farther away, then just the expansion of the universe is incredibly dominant in the motion of the galaxies, but you can still measure their proper motion and astronomers do that with redshifting. So you may know that the galaxy is some distance away using Cepheid variables, but then you can also measure its motion to redshifting. Now it's being redshifted away from us like all galaxies are that are really far away, but it might be redshifted a little less or a little more. And so you can have that be the additional movement that's coming from the galaxy's motion through the universe. But we see, you know, like we can see that we and Andromeda are hurtling towards each other. And that's purely, you know, Andromeda is blue shifted towards us. Melinda Green, it would be criminally incompetent to send people to live on Mars before demonstrating a successful biosphere test on Earth. Yeah, I agree with that. And also testing gestation in space because people are probably going to think that they can have a baby on Mars and it could be a you know it could have a horrible outcome every single time so so there are unsolved questions that we need to answer like we just can't do this quickly you don't want to live on Mars i mean maybe you want to live on Mars but i don't think you want to live on Mars and if you want to live on Mars then you should be living in the Arizona desert right now or whatever is the closest extremely inhospitable place to human life near you. Go there, live, make a garden, try to live off the land, do it, right? Like that's challenge. It's as close to Mars as you can get. See how long you enjoy it for. Now for some people, they love it. They're cut out for it. It's their favorite thing. Other people, they go and then a year later, they've had enough of it. And you'll find out if that's for you. And then you can assume that if you didn't enjoy the desert version, you won't enjoy the Mars version. Put a helmet on, carry a heavy backpack around with you, uh, and wait 45 minutes every time you use the internet. Adam Redwine, are there any plans for another iteration of Biosphere or some other fully contained ecosystem? So the Biosphere 2 just did its one year and then they realized that they weren't able to maintain the oxygen levels because the concrete was still curing, but they covered it up. And so that didn't go so well. And I actually got a chance to visit the Biosphere 2. It's an amazing facility. It's really cool. Um, but, but they weren't able to kind of continue on year after year after year. And so it's, it's no longer sealed. Like you can just go in and visit and check it out. And they run science experiments in the Biosphere, but but not the original intent, which is to close the whole place up, which I think is a mistake. Like I think they should keep it going. Uh, but yeah, there are other experiments. There are Mars analogs where people go into a place and although it's not they're not sealed up, they're still breathing air. Uh, they pretend like they're on Mars and try to go through all of the suiting up to get into their spacesuits, the communications delays, the limited resources, they try to simulate Mars as best they can in Hawaii. The Chinese have got a version of the biosphere that they call the Lunar Garden. And it's a lot smaller, but they were able to run this for I think a year. They've done multiple years now. 
in a closed environment and have been able to run it operationally. So, you know, this experiment is is ongoing because like the Chinese are very serious about putting a station on the moon and they want to make sure they understand all of the mechanisms, all of the things, all the inputs, all the outputs, what, you know, how well recycling water, air and so on works because they're going to have their lives on the line. They're testing out this technology now. It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above. Vu Krulez, Justin Kennedy, Fritz Ellie, Thomas Velez, John, Wayne Webster, J. Key, Aaron Music, Tyler Ott, and Flying Baldman. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. A. Smalls. I've been seeing a lot of stuff about space junk and the fact that we might trap ourselves on Earth. Is that really possible? It's not really possible. So the thing you're talking about is called the Kessler syndrome. And this is where, you know, if we get enough spacecraft in low Earth orbit crashing into each other, then it sort of leads into this cascade where one nice solid satellite turns into thousands of pieces of debris moving at 28,000 kilometers per hour, they smash into other satellites, those ones explode, sending out even more debris. And then eventually you just got this, this shield of metal around the earth. And then anyone who attempts to fly a spacecraft through it is just going to be like going through a buzzsaw. And then that's it. We're done. We're trapped on Earth. That's the that's the that's the thought. That's the idea. But it's not that cut and dry. That you know, for low Earth orbit, uh, this stuff, this debris, cleans itself up within a couple of years. And so, yeah, if you did cause some kind of cascade that took out all of the satellites in low Earth orbit, within five, 10, 15 years, they would all have reorbited, re-entered the atmosphere, burned up, and then space would be clear again. But it's it's not going to be this sort of like one tipping point where everything was fine. And then suddenly, all the satellites are shredded into little chunks of jagged metal. It's more that you just have an increased risk of damage to your satellites every year that goes by. The more stuff we put up there in the same orbits, the higher the chances are that they're going to crash into each other, the more debris that's going to be produced, the more risk you're going to face by having a spacecraft in there. But still, you know, because you know, if we're ever leaving Earth, we want to go to the moon or whatever, the the time that we spend in low Earth orbit, the time we spend in that area of the of the greatest debris is very short. And so we'll never be truly trapped here on Earth. Nick Stokes, if given an opportunity to go on a manned space flight, what kind of mission would you like to go on? Whatever is safe. That's the kind of mission I'd like to go on the safe one. So probably Crew Dragon into low Earth orbit, that would be all right. Like I am fascinated by space. But I also really like living on Earth. You know, people ask me like, Oh, would you like to go and live on Mars? No, thank you. Like, like, like literally just compare Earth and Mars, right? Earth, oceans, forests, civilization, cities, technology, uh, people, Mars, desert, no air, no water, challenge, no technology, no infrastructure. Um, no, thank you. Earth Earth is the best. But I would love to see the Earth from space. There are these balloon missions, like space perspectives where they take you to 30 kilometers altitude on a balloon. And that's high enough that you get a really good bird's eye view of the Earth that you can actually see the curvature of the Earth. That would be cool. You know, there's a bathroom you can sit there's, you know, look out the, these giant windows while you drink your tasty beverage. Yeah, that seems like a very civilized way to perceive the Earth from from space. But you know, I'm fascinated by space. I don't really want to go to space. Name, would you rather live on a floating habitat in Venus's atmosphere or a habitat on or below the surface of Mars? So I guess this is a follow on from the previous question, which is that, you know, I've mentioned that I'm very, I favor Earth. But are you like taking me away from Earth? You're going to destroy Earth. I don't get to choose to live on Earth. I would choose Mars. Being on a floating habitat in Venus would be really cool for five minutes where you're like, whoa, I'm on Venus. I can see the clouds below me. Crazy. 
and I'm trapped on this tiny little floating station for the rest of my life. That that will suck. Mars, at least you can walk around and explore. So no, I would take Mars over Venus. Kyle, why does everyone think the aliens would be out to kill us? We don't know what the aliens would want. But you know, it's pragmatic to expect that some percentage of them might have hostile plans for us. We are a potential threat down the road with our advancing technology and our uh, ability to expand out into the universe. And it might be that some alien civilization that's been around for a long time, and they've seen this happen over and over again, a young upstart civilization reaches out into the cosmos starts to grab territory and behaves badly. And so they may just be sick and tired of it. And they want to uh, shut it down. You know, we don't we don't know. So because we don't know, it's good to be cautious. Like people always ask this question, like, should we beam a signal out into space to let the aliens know that we're here? You know, on the one hand, the aliens know we're here, right? Like, if they have big telescopes, they know we're here. So we don't hide, we can't hide. But it does make sense to just be cautious to say, okay, it could be a dangerous universe out there. And we don't know what the response is going to be. We should just be careful before we uh, broadcast our existence out to the cosmos. Ken Soul, what is the rarest phenomena in the universe? I don't know. Um, you know, there are some really weird supernovae. Like even like a type 1a supernova, I mean, astronomers have been searching for them for decades, and we only have about 2500 of them so far. But Vera Rubin's going to give us a million. But there are even more weird, rare, remote types of supernova, ones that happen one thousandth of the time. But it's such a big universe. And so, you know, events happen very rarely, but across billions of light years, they're happening all the time. Gamma ray bursts you know, are very rare, you know, we don't, we won't see a gamma ray burst in our galaxy for probably 10s of 1000s of years. And yet every few days, astronomers detect one. So I don't really know what is a super rare event, where two stars collide, that's pretty rare, where a star falls into the envelope of another star, and then it goes supernova, that's pretty rare. So there's some weird flavors of supernova that have been seen and people have proposed very strange events, but they're seeing multiple versions of them. Big Bang only happened once. So that's pretty rare. Yeah, Big Bang. That would be the rarest phenomenon in the universe. It only happened once. Did you know that you can get the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, is abiogenesis really unlikely? I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had for this episode. Thank you everyone who asks your questions in the YouTube comments. Everybody who joins us for the live show, which we record normally every Monday somewhere in the world. We're on our hiatus, but we're back in about two weeks. So stay tuned for that. I'll post the live event soon. Uh, now I'm going to chat about some nostalgic science fiction. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bradley Griffin, Brian Bowie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Sign Nelson, David Gilson, and David Mass, Evan Pro, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Motto, Nick Borquez, Nick Solari, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fallon Munley, Vlad Chiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So I'm not a very nostalgic person, I tend to like to do things like watch things, play things, read things once, and then never do them again. Um, and I know other people feel you know, feel a lot of comfort in watching some movie they've seen a bunch of times or reading a book or whatever. I don't know, for me, like knowing what's going to happen makes me not want to do it. But as soon as I forget, what's going to happen, then it's fair game again. And especially because I know that I remember that I liked it originally. And so something I did recently was I went back and redid the entire Foundation series and brought myself up to speed just sort of in time for the new Foundation show. And that was great because it let me really critique the Foundation show as not being the books, but also enjoying it for what it is. And so the book series that I have picked up recently, again, is one of my favorites, one of the most influential book series that I ever read. And it's called Nine Princes in Amber by Roger Zelazny. And this was a book I read probably when I was 13 years old. 
It's about this guy who wakes up with amnesia, doesn't know who he is, but he realizes that he's a member of this large family. And then people start to uh, try to kill him, but also other people want to help him. And he's trying to figure out what's going on with his family. And it goes on to several books. And the ideas are great and uh, very interesting kind of a fantasy, if you're into that, but but also science fiction. Uh, they're great. And, you know, there's a bunch of old books that I read, I can remember, as a kid, you know, my my father was really into science fiction, actually, my mom too. And he had a, a bunch of books on this bookshelf of science fiction, like Niven, uh, Zelazny, Delaney, all these old old books. And when I was about, I guess, 11 years old or so, I, I started to go through these books and read them and realize that I love science fiction. And that's how I got so inspired. And that has sort of led me to my whole career. And so when I read these old books, I am reminded of of what made me so excited about space and astronomy and science fiction, and all of this all together. And so I guess there is some advantage to being a little nostalgic. So I would love to hear your nostalgic books. What are the 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 science fiction books, fantasy books that are sort of like right at the edge of your remembering you remember enjoying them, but it's been a while since you've read them. And maybe you're thinking, okay, maybe I'll go back and give another read. All right, uh, I'll let you know how this uh, latest run through my my favorite old books goes. Uh, and we'll see you next time.